Hello, I'm Margaret Miller. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to the curator's tour of the exhibition currently stall installed at the USF Contemporary Art Museum. It is titled Marking Monuments. It was curated by Sarah Howard. Sarah is the curator of public art and social practice and she will lead the tour today. I have the privilege of directing three programs in the College of the Arts, the Contemporary Art Museum, Graphic Studio and Public Art. Our mission generally is to engage emerging and leading artists of our time who are addressing compelling and relevant ideas and particularly themes of social justice. Artists are curated into temporary exhibitions or they may work as artists in residence at Graphic Studio to produce new work as print editions or sculpture multiples and or may be commissioned for a special project in the museum or in the broader community that we serve. The pandemic has required the Contemporary Art Museum to innovate new ways to organize and present temporary exhibitions and related educational programs. Marking Monuments is one of two current exhibitions currently installed in the museum. The sister exhibition titled Still Here, the Griffith J. Davis Photographs and Archives in Context um, is also uh, available on our website, cam.usf.edu. And if you go there, you can learn more about these projects, engage in a 3D tour of the projects. Um, so we're doing this kind of dual offering, both the physical exhibition and um, an online version. If you are a student or faculty at the University of South Florida, you may come into the museum to see these shows. Please make an appointment and be aware that both of these exhibitions will close on March 6th. The exhibition Marking Monuments receives support from the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, the Stanton Store Embrace the Arts Foundation, um, Art for Community Engagement Fund, the Leon Victor Levengood Endowment, and the Florida Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs. The USF Contemporary Art Museum works with a faculty advisory council from across the USF campuses and seeks partnerships to provoke interest and inspire dialogue for our students and in, and in the larger Tampa Bay community. This exhibition, Marking Monuments, was part of a collaboration with the Department of Anthropology. The Department of Anthropology developed a series of panels that were offered with the title Monuments, Markers, and Memory that focus on the critical exploration of power, politics, and activism around public monuments and memorials. The Monuments, Markers, and Memory series were made possible through a partnership between the the Florida Public Archaeology Network, the John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art, the USF Department of Anthropology, our museum, the USF Contemporary Art Museum, New College Public Anthrop Archaeology Lab, and the State College of Florida, Manatee, Sarasota. And the panels were also supported by a grant from the floor, from grants uh, from the Florida Humanities and the National Endowment for the humanities and an internal grant from USF Research One. Um, so please, during the conversation or the tour that Sarah will lead, if you think up a question, will you please enter it uh, on Zoom in the comments, uh, on the Zoom Q&A and in the comments if you're on Facebook. You may also decide to use the auto translation uh, function if you wish to have uh, the audio translated for the talk today. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Sarah Howard. Sarah? Thank you, Margaret, for that wonderful introduction and overview of the, of the exhibition and our partnership with uh, for the Monuments, Markers, and Memory series. I want to thank all our viewers for attending tonight. It's nice to see so many um, familiar names and new new names as well. So thank you for being here with us. 
I also want to acknowledge and thank our brilliant artists for their talented contributions for the exhibition. It's been a pleasure working with all of them. And so we're very excited to continue to um, feature their work as part of this show. And I also want to acknowledge our funders for this exhibition um, that make this possible. And I, I can't forget our wonderful staff at CAM who um, just are incredible and have really risen to the challenges that this um, current situation has presented for us. And so um, I'm delighted that we're able to use this virtual platform to speak with you this evening. As Margaret mentioned, there is a live auto transcription available under closed captioning um, on your, on, if you're on Zoom, if that's available to you. Um, I also wanna start with land acknowledgement. While I'm speaking to you today from the traditional and unceded lands of the Chikara, Waccamaw, and Winya people, we are all convening virtually from Florida and beyond. I would like to take a moment to reflect and acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Seminole, Tokabago, and Calusa tribes' native lands that the University of South Florida and the museum occupy, and that those of us on Florida's Gulf Coast are learning, working, and organizing today. As a current occupant and legacy of the settler colonial state, I believe it's important that we recognize the inequitable structures and systems present in these spaces that act as barriers to racial, social, and environmental justice and commit to moving beyond words and statements into action that embodies a commitment to human rights, justice, and cultural equity for all. So as Margaret mentioned, you can insert your questions into the Q&A or the comments section on Facebook Live. And to start, we're gonna um, present an overview of the website and exhibition platform. So you can familiarize yourself in case you wanna go back and um, look at any of the works that we discussed today. So if we can launch the website. So we've got a website page. Um, it's under exhibitions at um, uh, cam. What is it? cam.edu. Um, our exhibition page that features um, an overview of the exhibition, as well as some of the press links for recent press that we received for the show, and also um, the events associated with an exhibition. We, in addition to a virtual platform, which we'll be looking at this evening to take the tour, we also have web pages uh, dedicated to each artist and each project in the exhibition, as well as the essay and um, the forward and acknowledgements that are part of the exhibition brochure, which is also accessible via this page. So you can click on the exhibition brochure, it'll pop up in a PDF and you can dig in for those that don't have a physical copy. And then further down on the page, we have uh, links to a uh, symposium that we held at the beginning of the exhibition where we gathered all the artists and had them um, discuss their experiences with the work and, and their inspiration behind the work. And it's a really fabulous conversation. If you have time and want to hear directly from the artists, that's also archived here that you can visit. Um, so we can go ahead and launch the virtual tour which is really cool. We were able to partner with um, the USF 3D Access Lab and Dr. Harrison and her team put this together for us. Then they came in and physically scanned the museum and built this model for us, which is fabulous. It's a great tool and resource. So this exhibition was conceived over this past summer as public monuments to colonizers, slave traders, and white supremacists were defaced, toppled, and ousted from their elevated plants as they became targets and central sites of protest against police brutality and activism against systemic racism in the wake of the horrific murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and too many others. And so what I wanted to do with this exhibition was really seek to provoke, pro promote dialogue and engage with the global discourse, confronting and dismantling colonialists and anti-Black markers in public space by presenting artists' interventions and creative reimaginings of monuments that challenge, erase, or transform our dominant histories and narratives 
to offer proto prototypes for what we could imagine would be equitable representation in public culture. So this landscape, the monumental landscape is rapidly changing. Over this past year, we've seen a number of monument sites transformed into contested spaces and sites of activism affecting change in public space. And this week, civil rights advocacy group, the Southern Poverty Law Center recently released a report that 168 Confederate symbols were renamed or removed from public spaces in 2020. That number refers not only to statues, flags, monuments, but also city seals, official state holidays, and names of schools, streets, and other public spaces. And all but one of those were removed or altered following George Floyd's murder. So this is like a, a really, this movement is really taking off and we're seeing that um, these Confederate, specifically Confederate symbols had how embedded they are in our, in our public culture and, and landscape. So I, I like to think of uh, artists as sort of our cultural first responders that are really reflecting and responding to our contemporary moment and th they're asserting the power and the potential of art and the vital role of the artist to challenge and reframe critical social issues and offer ways to re-envision underrepresented narratives and diverse perspectives in our, in our public space. So these projects that I'll explore with you tonight, they all respond to the historical context of existing monuments, their site and community, to shed light on questions of commemoration and illuminate issues of visibility, permanence and inclusion and representation. Who is responsible for inscribing public space? Who is being honored and how? How do monuments and memorials generate knowledge and memory of our past, present and future? So really like looking at how cl collective public memory is constructed through monuments and memorials. And so this exhibition posed a challenge of not how only to re-represent these works that were performed in public space within the physical galleries, but also through these online platforms. And so that's why it's so great that we have this virtual model um, so that you can get a sense of how the gallery space feels. Um, and so this exhibition includes representations of works that engage with monuments and markers in both global and local contexts but I also wanted to include a platform for viewers to examine and engage monuments in their own communities or experience. And so that's the project you're looking at now. Um, this is a project by Monument Lab, it's called Field Trip, and it's a hands-on activity guide to examine and envision monuments in your own community. And, and it was conceived by Monument Lab, which is a public art and history studio based in Philadelphia. The Monument Lab works with artists, students, educators, activists, municipal agencies, and cultural institutions on participatory approaches to public engagement and collective memory. So it was founded in 2012 by Paul Farber and Ken Lum, and it, the Monument Lab really cultivates and facilitates critical conversations around the past, present, and future of monuments. And so the field trip, if we can pull up the field trip, um, document. This was designed and illustrated by Mike Mirowski and Brianna uh, Campbell with Supernature Adventures. But <clears throat> the, the um, activity really seeks to unpack how power is constructed and offering participants prompts to critical questions and exercises to consider the role monuments play in constructing and confronting history and collective memory in public space. So they, it's an exercise that's accessible for any age, really, um, as long as they are able to write. Um, and it actually takes you through a series of exercises to allow you to kind of look at a monument, map out the space, kind of look at, at how it's functioning in the site. And then it kind of prompts these questions about power and presence. So Monument Lab defines monuments as statements of power and present in public space. And so that exercise is really digging deeper <clears throat> into these aspects of, of how these monuments are constructed and then asking you to sort of like reimagine a new monument for your community. 
So these printed guides are um, that we have printed guides available in the museum, but you can also explore this um, in your own space. Um, you can download it from either our exhibition page or go straight to Monument Labs website, which is an excellent resource. Um, and you know you can do this activity from the safety of your own home using Google Street View or other online mapping tools. And Monument Lab is really, they're collecting data about how people respond to monuments, what people are thinking about monuments. So they're really encouraging people to share their activity once they've completed it by just posting it on social media or sending it directly to them um, and then tagging either Monument Lab or hashtagging them and um, adding in the, the field trip hashtag. So, that's a really great adventure, uh, a great exercise um, that you can take off, do with educators or um, offer to any classes, but also just do on your own with your family. Um, and I, I thought this was a really great um, project to be able to include. And so I'm so glad we were able to install it and give it some actual presence in the museum with the, um, we took part of the expanding the pedestal graphic and place that up on the wall to give people that idea about, you know, sort of unfixing history and thinking it outside the box and really exploring where you might be able to take that. And so, as I said, Monument Lab has a really great um, website. They, are, they have podcasts, they have bulletins, they're extremely engaged in this um, and have been for over a decade. Um, in these issues surrounding monuments, and they've been a real leader in guiding the, the research and community engaged process of reimagining monuments for future generations. They were recently awarded a Mellon Foundation grant to conduct an audit of the nation's monuments and research how the country's history is told in public space to reflect the multiplicity of stories and diversity of narratives across the country. So now we'll move into the Love and Good Gallery, and if you follow along and we'll look at um, this installation on the left by Jory Minaya. Jory Minaya was born in 1990. She's a US born and Dominican raised multidisciplinary artist living and working in New York City. Her practice confronts historic and contemporary representations of black and brown womanhood, tropical identity and the gays in order to decolonize and subvert imposed histories and hierarchical representations of culture. Manaya's work is centered on the intersection between colonialism, tourism, and labor, <clears throat> excuse me, and how the diversity and multiplicity of Caribbean identities becomes flattened in Western stereotypes and picturesque constructions of tropicality. So this installation on the left is, uh, is the proposal for artistic intervention intervention on the Columbus statue in front of the government house in, the Na in Nassau, the Bahamas from 2017. And it's a composite rendering of Manaya's proposed intervention for the government house in Nassau, Bahamas, which was unable to be realized. And um, she mentioned in that artist talk that she was told that the Bahamas was not ready to have that conversation. <clears throat> so um, very, very cleverly, she um, for this exhibition she was part of at the National Gallery of Art of the Bahamas, she produced postcards with this composite image that she had built in Photoshop to elicit public responses to the proposal. And so she's sort of playing off of this form of the tourist souvenir postcard um, as an effective response to comment on how the construction of tropicality is supported and marketed for consumption by the tourism and leisure industries. So there's a link here um, because we have those postcards on display with some a selection of the responses, but there's also a link here to her website. If you click on that button there, um, she that'll take you to her website where you can view some of the postcard responses that were both in support of and um, critical of her proposal. It's very interesting to see the different responses. And then over to the right, we have uh, an installation representing uh, two interventions that she conducted in 2019. These projects were commissioned by uh, Fringe Projects, which is a public art agency based in Miami. And they do really great uh, temporary um, and ephemeral projects 
um, and just fantastic agency down there. Um, if you want to check out their website. But so this is called the title for these is the cloaking of the statues of Ponce de Leon at the torch of friendship and Christopher Columbus behind the Bayfront Park Amphitheater in Miami, Florida. So both of these um, monuments to colonizers are located on Biscayne Boulevard and in a park there that looks over um, Biscayne Bay. And so these are framed photo documentation of the two public interventions in Miami that are mounted on fields of wallpaper, replicating the cloaking patterns that were used in the fabric coverings that she used to cover the, the figures. So she covered these figures with these tropical patterns and she, she's stripping them of their identities, subverting and camouflaging their colonizing power. And so her patterns were created using hand-drawn images of plants, referencing the aesthetics of early colonizers' botanical illustrations, illustrations, which were used as a tool to assess natural resources of newly discovered, I'm putting that in quotes, territories. So she's got illustrations of manchineal trees, castor bean plants, yap and holly, kunti palms, and rampe saraguay. If you're a Floridian, you'll be familiar with a lot of those species that are um, present in our contemporary culture. But so she's weaving these indigenous and Afro-diasporic histories of resistance and rituals of protection into these fabric cloakings. And she's highlighting the use of these plants for their dual powers of both healing and toxicity. So if you know how to, to use the plant, which is, you know, um, sort of knowledge that may have been lost through colonizers, um, then you know how to strip it and use it for either purpose. Um, and it also, a lot of these um, plants have a potent ability for cleansing or um, potentially warding away spirits. So the Calusa people use the Manchineal plant to poison their arrows. And this is also what killed Ponce de Leon. So she's really got this subversion of, of this, um, these plants sort of serving as a form of protection and reframing the figures as symbols of strength and resilience in the face of contemporary colonization. And if you go on to her webpage on that um, exhibition page, there's um, larger images of these um, photographs that you can view more closely and see the beautiful illustrations of the wallpaper patterns. And so now we'll pivot over to the corner where we have John Sims installation. And John Sims was born in 1968. He's a Detroit native and Sarasota based artist writer and social justice activist whose interdisciplinary creative practice expands to installation, text, film, music, and per performance projects. For the past two decades, Sims has been actively challenging white supremacy and confronting Confederate iconography and commemoration through long-term multimedia projects, annual public performances, and political op-eds. So Sims, is really using the power of like reclamation to confront anti-Black iconography and Confederate com commemoration with his 2020 work, Freedom Memorial at Gamble Plantation, which we're seeing here. The installation features an animation proposing new memorials, markers, and symbols to challenge the narrative and romanticization of a Confederate legacy and shift this plantation site commemorative focus to re-envision the former sugarcane plantation and Florida State Park in Ellington, Florida as a space for healing and reconciliation. So this site uh, is currently serves at the, as the headquarters for the Florida Division of the United Daughters of Confederacy, who donated the land to the state in 1925 as a memorial to Judah P. Benjamin, who is a Confederate officer who briefly took refuge at the site before escaping from the approaching Union, Union forces at the end of the war. Civil War. So Sims' proposal includes um, a few of the elements shown here, um, but also an animation which pulls together all these elements in a flyover animation of the, uh, of the plantation site. So he's proposing a name change for the park, 
which is named for Judah P. Benjamin and is a memorial to him. Uh, an obelisk with, inscribed with the names of the last enslaved people known to have worked and lived at Gamble Plantation and a recontextualized historical marker to honor the plantation's enslaved Africans and their descendants. So let's um, cue the animation and we'll um, get to hear the, the, the sound element. And Frost also the view a part of this. Cleese, cleese was shy as a butcher's cleaver, but that did not seem to grieve her. Look away. Look away, look away, Dixieland. Oh, missus acted the foolish part, died for a man that broke her heart. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. I wish I was in Dixie, hooray, hooray, in Dixieland I'll take my stand to live and die in Dixie, away, away, away down south in Dixie, away. Away, away down south in Dixie. Now here's a health to the next old missus and all the gals that want to kiss us. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. But if you want. And you can view that full seven minute video on the website. Um, the installation also features Sims African Confederate flag, which reclaims and transforms the Confederate symbol with the colors of the Pan-African and Black liberation movement. And then we can look at the um, recontextualized historic marker that John is proposing for the renamed Freedom Memorial at Gamble Plantation. Um, so this uh, installation is following two decades of work by John Sims engaged in the ongoing cultural dialogue and movement to dismantle toxic symbols of white supremacy and in to institutionalize racism around the globe. So his proposal for Gamble Plantation is part of an urgent and larger call to action to repeal Florida state laws protecting and celebrating Confederate heritage and anti-Black iconography. And I've put the link to his petition in the chat in case any of you are interested in signing on to that petition. And then um, we can pivot over to the left or the right um, and we'll discuss Karen Olivier's work Karen Olivier was born in 1968, and she's a Philadelphia-based artist and educator who creates public art, sculpture, and installations that expose social, political, and economic contradictions and the residue of slavery in contemporary culture. Olivier's work often explores public versus private space, revealing opportunities for expanded approaches to accessibility and inclusivity. So this piece was commissioned, uh, This um, it was commissioned by Monument Lab as part of a citywide exhibition inviting 20 artists to respond to the question, what is an appropriate monument for our current city of Philadelphia? An artist, Karen Olivier's The Battle is Joined, looks to the past to reflect the present by intertwining, two, uh, intertwining histories from two monuments and war memorials located in Vernon Park in Philadelphia's Germantown neighborhood. So one of these memorials was dedicated to German settler Francis Daniel Pastoris, who led the first Quaker revolt against slavery in 1688 and was encased and concealed from public view during both World War I and II for being considered too Germanic. So Olivier is responding to that act of encasement and she transformed this 20 foot high memorial into a mirror clad monument to honor the local community. 
and she effectively renders the existing monument invisible and the reflective surface captures, depicts, and magnifies the presence of the surrounding residents and their landscape and activities to honor the contemporary African-American neighborhood. So for the installation, we um, put together still images of Olivier's um, installation in, in 2017. And they're accompanied by an auto recording of Philadelphia poet laureate Trepeta B. Mason's reading of Monuments to Brown Boys, which was commissioned for this work. So Trepeta B. Mason is a, a Liberian born poet, teacher and licensed social worker. And her work shines light on and honors the immigrant experience and amplifies the experience of community life as a catalyst to mobilize, build and create social transformation. So if we can pull up um, that video. Monuments to Brown Boys. The artists install the mirror over the monument and the people have come to gawk. Rubber neckers wonder what was there before and you have come too, laying in the cut, statue still for seconds your reflection edging off a 20-foot high bronze looking glass. You are an alluring hunk of stone beguiling me. Yes, you, brown boy, rough cut monolith, I see you. You are a low-slung jean-wearing grandmother greeting pillar, an obelisk marking the entrance of your hood. You need to be somebody's memorial, not only when you laid out and lowered in the dirt, your pillow a marble headrest of past tense. He was, he once, he lived. No, you are now in present, alive and in color, and you need to be somebody's walking shrine, somebody's testament, somebody's tribute in this city. You have to be carved, stretched, and erect, a column to buttress boogeymen, the phantoms they say you imagine, the specters and goblins who told bullets and policies and laws that encase you. You need to be somebody's memento. Look how you beaming off that seeing glass. I'm catching your shine. Look at that swagger you carrying, hoodie wearing, fresh fade having, full teeth grinning. You need to be somebody's something to fight for, somebody's celebration, somebody's stone turned monument, carved and smooth, our masterpiece in this city. Thank you. Now we will pivot to the last work that we're gonna discuss by Ariel Renee Jackson. She was born in 1991 and works across film, sculpture and performance, exploring land and landscape as sites of internal representation. Their work is centered in investigations of ancestral memory and knowledge and informed by research on economic and social systems of segregation cultivating intergenerational dialogues around themes of loss, transformation, and growth. So um, this work's called in uh, Bentonville Forecast in the Square. So she's really using narrative to inform and cultivate relationships between the site and the community. And during the fall of 2019, during their residency at the Momentary in Arkansas, Jackson became aware of the history of discriminatory practices of all white sundown towns in the Midwest and Ozark regions. And while Bentonville wasn't a sundown town, there was a Confederate monument in the public square at the center of town. The monument was all, uh, removed this past September. Jackson's research into sundown towns led them to focus on how marginalized groups rely on oral histories as forms of data to communicate experience and their sense of a place. So like forecasting whether it is a welcoming place or not, a, a space of belonging. So Jackson uses the metaphor of a weather balloon used to typically measure atmospheric conditions of the environment but also as a tool to obscure and conceal the statue from view. And uh, Jackson incorporates uh, inter intergenerational voices of four local artists and activists reflecting on their experiences and perceptions of the Confederate soldier as a symbol and marker of exclusion 
and, intim and intimidation on their city's landscape. So we can go ahead and show that video. What were some initial thoughts when you learned that the statue existed? I suppose I saw it when I, I rented a space right across the street from it. It's a gallery space right next to the um, Walmart Museum. And I, I was putting all of my stuff up there. And I looked straight out there and that's what I see. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, a white dude in a square in a white town. Shocker. Like, I truly did not know, and no one ever told me that it was. No one told me who he was. I would bring my lunch, and that's when I first saw the soldier. But before it was just out there, wasn't the, the landscaping or anything like that. So you could see that Confederacy on it, where it was marked, so you knew that's what it was. It was one of those things that you just, just well, this is what it is. Of course I'm offended, I'm bothered by it, but what do you do? I mean, this is where we lived. It shouldn't be a battle, but it needs to be addressed, yes. What are the effects of the statue being there? The effect is negative. On, it's not like Google Maps says, hey girl, you're about to roll into a racist town. I wish it did. So like those kinds of things are all that we have as people of color. And so I think that the effect on other people, especially people who want this area to thrive and um, want to live here, uh, it, it really makes them angry because it tells other people who look like them don't. If it were part of a legitimate historical thing, then it might make sense. But this was placed there as a means of stamping a place as being a white supremacist place. I'm concerned about the kids. They're our future. All kids. Because children play on that statue. They, they are off in the little pond trying to get the money out. And it's got confederacy on there. Uh, I wonder how young parents are explaining to their children about this. Are they glossing it over? Are they telling them the truth? You know, it has a lot of ramifications. I don't want to just go for the statute. I want to go definitely on the one-on-one -on -one of the principle of what it represents. We just want it like every, everyone else. We want a decent living. We want to be able to make a good living, a very good living, not relegated to because we're, you know, black or you come in from a different perspective. Um, our kids to be looked upon as equals. And how do you do that? It's just constantly, you know, conversation. When my daughter comes to visit me, I want her to feel happy, okay? And how it would be nice for my kids to want to feel, to want to come home and be here all the time and have this place is really, this is special and that they don't have to find a box inside their head so that they cannot run and play in, in a place where they should feel comfortable enough to scream and la you know, be happy and laugh and, and run. The monuments are a part of history, but not of today's history. It's uh, you know, a point where reality has to take the place instead of the mistruths that have been told about the monument. What frightens me is that I see a lot of African Americans and you can see by the look on their face, uh, the fear is still there. Don't be sad. Yeah, I'm still alive and I've been this way for all of my life. You'll be okay. We need you. <laughs> Thank you. I just, I love that statement at the end, like we need you, it really just speaks to how important artists' roles are in society of being able to present these other perspectives and to really challenge um, these type of markers in our, in our civic space with a way that really 
can tap into our sense of empathy and, you know, just provide us some pathways of, to understanding and um, of how these, these toxic symbols really impact people's lives. And so um, we can open it up to questions if we have any. Um, please put them in the Q&A section. Yeah, there are a couple of questions, um, Sarah. Uh, let's see, this one comes in regarding John Sims Freedom Memorial at Gamble Plantation. I've heard this amazing version of Dixie before. Can you tell us the name of the vocalist? Oh, I should know that. It's, it's on the credits on the video and I okay. just don't have it in my head right now. I'm sorry. Okay. I was curious as well. I'm gonna watch the video when I'm in there next time. Uh, three questions I have. Uh, here for you this first one's this exhibition confronts idealized beliefs of confederate and southern history and heritage deeply rooted in white supremacy in light of the current political and cultural divisions in the nation around how history is represented have you received any pushback or criticism of this exhibition um i personally am not aware of any criticism or pushback. Um, I think that this a university museum really presents a um, is a, a kind of an ideal place to, to question these sorts of um, issues and to address them and promote dialogue about them and how we can come to um, reflect and look at what's happening in our society like while it's happening. Um, I think contemporary art, that, that's a, an amazing tool for um, delving deeper into those conversations that can often be challenging and, you know, and, and critical to what people might believe or sort of where their stance of beliefs are. And we are at a very pivotal moment, I think, where people feel like you have to kind of take a stand and, um, I certainly want to be able to do that in my work and I appreciate the university and the opportunity to do that. I'm very honored to have that privilege. If, if I could add, um, my day job is at the front of the museum. Uh, oh yeah, and, whatever and, you heard. <laughs> and, <laughs> let me tell you. Actually, uh, although uh, our numbers of people coming in are down from what they would have been before, uh, before COVID and uh, uh, in this process of uh, making reservations to come in, a lot of people have come through and I've not heard anything negative. Everyone has thanked me and been very interested, walked out reading the brochure. So I think um, the slice of folks that are coming through um, have been very engaged by uh, this exhibition. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, I have another, another question. Uh, what are some other resources you might recommend for further research and investigation of monuments? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so Monument Lab, as I mentioned, is really like a leading organization. They published this really fantastic book um, of their um, exhibition they did in 2017 with the inviting 20 artists to in develop prototypes for monuments. Um, there's also a number of other organizations that have been sort of working on the grassroots efforts. Um, paper, mo paper Monuments based in New Orleans was also doing this type of work and actually they're one of their founders is now working with Monument Lab, um, but they've been really um, digging deep into issues in, in New Orleans, as is um, Take Them Down NOLA. And then there's some really interesting organizations. Um, there's an organization in Richmond, Virginia, that is um, made up of archivists and historians and artists, and they are called History is Illuminating. And they have been putting up recontextualized markers. They were like making prototypes of markers and putting them up along Richmond's Monument Avenue and um, providing more information and background. And so there was this kind of a little bit of a battle going on between the city where they were going and taking down their sort of prototype markers. But they, um, they're pretty active on Instagram. And so they do a lot of um, interesting work. Also. Um, Art Papers has just released their um, monumental intervention issue and in which a lot of these articles are available on their website. Um, they're making them available online. 
And that's a really great way. There's also a really interesting organization called Toppled Monuments or Toppled Interventions. Um, that's a group of archivists that are that are archiving all of these um, that these monuments that are being toppled nationally, but I think also internationally. Wow, really? So if you're if you're yeah. interested in following along, I know it's been a um, yeah. it's like it's happening so fast. Excellent. Well, I've had a couple questions more come in, and there's been an answer. The jazz track is from Mr. Sim's album, The Afro Dixie Remixes. The vocalist, I believe, is Ali Crouch. Oh, thank you for I that. C O U C H. Coach. Thank you for so good. doing that research. Here's a here's a question that's come in. Uh, uh, the artists seem to be covering up, transforming, and adding to the monuments rather than removing them completely. Does this reflect current artists' thoughts on monuments, do you think? Uh, I don't know that I could exactly reference totally, you know, what artists think about monuments. I do know that I think people feel like things don't necessarily need to be so permanent. Um, and there are so many artists that have come up with just like incredible ideas for monuments. There's a, a piece by Paul Ramirez and Jonas that I'm thinking of that's called Eternal Flame and it's an obelisk that's like a grill and you can put it up and there's like different sides of the grill. It was at Socrates Sculpture Park. Just like fabulous ways that the that artists are looking at um, you know, creating new monuments that are more community engaged or creating, um, you know, space for gathering and not just marking the landscape with, you know, something set in stone that is, is not able to be uh, transformed or engaged, engaged with in any way. So I think there's a lot of talk around those kinds of things of like, what, what is going to happen to these empty plants? Can there be more revolving um, exhibitions or engagement with monuments so that um, they're not all responding to this issue? Like maybe we move past that where we ha we're having to respond to what's existing and sort of inviting new ways of creating these types of memorials, really. I mean, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about kind of COVID and the, the many, many victims and how this time will be memorialized. And I think that that's gonna be a really interesting um, uh, and sorrowful um, aspect to look at how we look back at this time and memorialize it. Yes, it's definitely a huge, a huge time in history for, for change at hopefully a rapid rapid pace um good question has come in uh is there a is there is there a petition we can sign to have these changes made at gamble plantation yes and i put that link in the chat and i can put it in there again um i don't know if maybe i didn't do it right but i i put the link in the chat it's change.org i mean if you google john samson petition it comes right up so um Okay, a couple of ways to get there. Yeah. Good. Uh, I like this question. Sarah, where do you think the John Sims redesigned flag should fly in Tampa? <laughs> well, we were talking about this earlier about how um, the gentleman that um, flies the largest Confederate flag in the nation at the intersection of I-4 and I-75 recently passed away. And we were sort of wondering what was gonna happen um, someone mentioned that they had seen that the flag is flying at half mass now. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I, we all think that would be a really great site. Would that flag, this is a question for me, would that flag, uh, would uh, Sims consider that flag installed in an actual flagpole site? Is that something that, that he would do? Or yeah, is it and actually, be displayed when, in this kind of context that we're in right now with the museum? Yeah, when we were um, initially speaking about this project and we were sort of thinking about how we could um, how we could find a flagpole to a support it, like I, he wanted one that was the same size, which I think is thirty feet. Ours that we have hanging in the museum is about twelve, and I think he did a twenty-four foot one that he installed at the um, Ringling. 
And so you need a really large flagpole to, to support something of that size. And so we were trying to think of sites that we could, you know, possibly, and it got to a point where he even like looked into, I guess they make mobile flagpoles. I don't know if it's some kind of like truck or something that supports it. Well, in a hurricane, so, they're all mobile. <laughs> so we, I know he was doing a lot of research. And so, you know, I think that's a continuing um, project for him because he does these commemoration um events yearly you know how to how to burn and bury the confederate flag it does Excellent. that every memorial right. day and i think on july 4th as well right here's a here's a, a nice uh, question i'm curious about the growing trend in augmented reality as an education tool when layered on monuments have you run across anything with regards to that um not augmented you, you... reality per se i mean there are a ton of artists and activists using projection hmm. on monuments. And you've seen that a lot with um, Robin Bell's a DC based artist. He's been doing a lot of activism with projection. Um, and also um, this group out of Richmond that I'm just blanking on their names. I can't think of it right now. Um, but they they do a lot of uh, projections on the Robert E. Lee Memorial that at Marcus Davis Peters Circle in Richmond. Um, but I haven't seen any augmented reality, but I'm not like super tapped into that kind of technology. So I'm yeah, sure Pokemon Go doesn't count. <laughs> what is what is your personal interest in the monument movement, Sarah? Um that's a good question. I um, I grew up outside of Washington, D.C., and I went to school in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, so monuments have always been sort of a, you know, pre a presence in our in my landscape growing up. Um, and especially in Richmond, uh, you know, they're ubiquitous. You know, it's like you can't sort of avoid them. But we never, you know, everybody just hated them and we never engaged with them. And so I was just so excited to see those monuments come down this summer. I was watching online. I've been following on social media. And it was like, it just, it was just something like, I just don't think we ever thought was going to happen. And um, I just really have an interest in public space and sort of our, our civic role um, as citizens. And uh, I just really like to explore what what that sort of power and presence is in public space and how we, you know, are engaged with our civic infrastructure and our architecture, um, our green spaces, and yeah. really like what is impacting, enhancing, not helping, you know, and just always trying to look at that space as, and I just thought since the pandemic, it has been so interesting as we're all sort of isolated that, that the, the public space is sort of where the, what we're experiencing as a society is being reflected. Hmm. So when we were all isolating, it all became very vacant and quiet and we saw like nature taking over. Right. Hmm. And now that we're sort of, you know, the, with the uprisings and the activism and the protests in the street and sort of the outrage that we're all feeling like being spilling out into that space. And so I just think it's a, a really interesting space to, to, to see what's being reflected in society. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have one more question has just come in. I, as we see more interest in thinking about re-envisioning monuments and the spaces they occupy, are you seeing increased opportunities for funding and supporting artists to create new works for national and or for local funding agencies? Um, I, I don't know that we're seeing, you know, I, I think we're seeing funding shifting a little bit um, where we're kind of all in a, in a little bit of a, a crunch, a critical sort of compression with funding. So I d certainly think we've seen a rise in a lot of um, emergency or funding towards artists to just, you know, help them 
um, through this time when a lot of opportunities have been canceled for artists. Um, I think we're starting to see foundations open up like, you know, some private and civic foundations open up a little bit to start addressing social issues in a new way. And I'm hoping that artists will be at the forefront of that effort. One more. Let's see, I'm trying to read this from the smaller, uh, just came in. Have you followed the story of the removable, sorry, the removal of Silent Sam Memorial on the University of North Carolina campus? Does a university have a special obligation to, to react to monuments like this? I do remember Silent Sam and that there was a controversy about it and some of the students had taken it down. I haven't followed it very closely, um, so I'm not quite as up to date on that one. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, this is the interesting thing about, especially these Confederate monuments, is that they were, they were so crafted in the way that they protected these monuments and these spaces. And that's why you're seeing things like the Lee Monument and in um, Richmond be so hard to get down because of the laws that were put in place. And we're starting to see this kind of pushback from uh, the previous presidential administration, but also you're in the UK where they're writing laws now, I think, I think they're doing this in Florida to protect these monuments again, right? Like, so they don't wanna acknowledge it, they wanna protect it, they, you know, maybe want to recontextualize it, but they're, the way that they were sort of um, established and the, the foundation of their placement was rooted in these systemic structures and of inequality and, and supported by legislation of the way, like the Gamble Plantation, for example, being donated as a memorial. So like it's buried in that language. And so I, I don't know the, specifics of the Silent Sam, but I, I mean, I, if it's on the university grounds, I think the university has a role. I don't know specifically how this particular memorial and, you know, it's like, it's right. sort of, it's established with its, like if it's on specific property and that property was donated. And so it's built into its, um, the foundation of it. Yeah. The, the, um, evidently the, um, United Daughters of the Confederacy did it, and I was put up like in 1913 or something like that, right at the the gateway, the doorway of of the the university. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Hmm. That is, I know. As soon as I say this, I know I might have more come in, but here's Margaret Miller. That's the last question that I uh, that I have uh, brewing here. Thank you so much, Dave. You're welcome. Glad to help. It's a great show. Well, um, oh, I'm not on uh, here. We can hear you. <laughs> Oops. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I am so appreciative of your research and your curatorial work and commitment to designing exhibitions and performances, engaged projects uh, that, that offer platforms for artists to provoke and engage the public on critical and relevant issues of our time related particularly to issues of social justice, equity, and climate change. So we look forward to your continued work and offerings. Thank you. At the beginning, I should have uh, mentioned Dave Waterman is our chief of security, but like many staff, he has lots of hats. And you can see he has an amazing voice and ability to synthesize questions. Um, so Dave, thank you uh, for managing the Q&A. You're welcome. Most of your big range of talents, as so many of the staff, you know, our very small staff, are so talented and wear so many hats. I hope you will follow and continue to follow what we are doing at CAM. The, the website, uh, again, is cam.usf.edu, or you can just Google the University of South Florida Contemporary Art Museum and make your way through so many of our past exhibitions, our conversations with artists, they're all kind of banked on uh, this website. And you can sign up for blasts that will, that will help you keep up with, what, with our programs and what we are doing. 
um, and various social media uh, platforms. So coming up, I'll just give you a heads up, is a exhibition of our uh, graduating MFAs called Out to Pasture, and that will go up in April and May. And then Sarah's back in focus again as a curator for uh, one of the curators for a project called Skyway that will be installed in June through September. And it's a project that we are uh, putting, um, uh, that we have uh, collaborated with other local museums, including the Tampa Museum of Art, the Ringling Museum um, in Sarasota and the Museum of Fine Arts in St. Petersburg. And this is, we're delighted to be participating in this collection of exhibitions that will spotlight some of the best regional artists. So follow us. I can't promise you what the, the future holds in terms of access to the museum, uh, but I think we're committed at this point to looking at innovative ways to keep a very active virtual presence that will introduce you to these projects and the thinking of our curators. Uh, it's really uh, Christian Viveros Fonet and Sarah Howard that are serving as our curators. And we're looking forward to the exhibition program uh, that they cook up and research as we move forward over the next three years. So thank you for attending tonight. Thank you again, Sarah and Dave. And I'll look forward to seeing many of you, I hope, in a not too distant future and actually physically in the museum. If you're a student or faculty, please come by and sign up to come in and see the uh, two shows that are up currently before they close on March 6. So good night, everybody, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. Much appreciated uh, conversation. Good night. <laughs>